By the way, um, before maybe we go into, into this today, how many people need a review of cross product? And right hand rule. Yeah, find the most people do. Um, we do cover it in physics 4A, but um, for some of you, it's been a while. And for many of you, the first time you covered it, you didn't really get it. And <laughs> you figured you could get through the class without it. But I will tell you, with the magnetism, even the very fundamental interaction is stated in terms of cross product. And when we get to what, how magnetic fields are produced, that will also involve cross product. So what it comes down to is that if you feel like you are not solid in understanding a cross product, it's like trying to get through, I don't know, trying to get through the rest of physics when you don't know how to multiply numbers together. So, so it's that important. So I thought we should actually spend a little bit of time going over cross product. Um, so let's go over this cross product thing. You know, you guys, you have seen it first time in physics 4A, but once again, the reason I'm to, uh, taking time to do this is in physics 4A, you could have actually gotten through most of it if you felt you didn't understand cross product. It wasn't that important. It's, yeah, it wasn't that important. But with the magnetism, if you don't understand cross product, then you might as well give up now <laughs> because the rest of the class until the end of the semester won't really make all that much sense. So, so you know, let's go over pro cross product. As uh, you recall, cross product is how you describe multiplying two vectors together. So you might say uh, cross product C is a result of multiplying two vectors, A and B, uh, A cross B. And for Sake of clarity, let me draw some, or sake, sake of concreteness, let me draw a representation of vector A and a representation of vector B on the board. So I'm gonna take care to make vector A point downward so that I don't accidentally do not desalute. Um, so this is vector A. And vector B, uh, it can be going many different ways. Let me just have it go this way. So these are the two vectors that I'm looking at to get a, a cross product. So uh, let me quickly go through the exercise we did in physics 4A to try to give you an intuitive feel for why we define the cross product the way we define it. So what you have right now is two vectors, right? And um, this is sort of my first goal in that um, after I multiply these two, I want to get a vector back because I already have a product that will give me a scalar back. That's a dot product. We, most of you are already familiar with it. Here, my goal is to get a vector back. So the f mathematically, geometrically, what you are searching for is that given these two vectors, how would I define a third vector so that the direction of third vector is uniquely defined by direction of these two vectors? So the two vectors in geometry, what, uh, what do, there's a geometrical object that two vectors can define. What is that? A plane. A plane. It can, uh, two vectors, it's like two lines that cross each other, they can define a plane, as long as they're not collinear. Good? So, all right, so I want to be able to describe the direction of a plane. How do you describe the direction of a plane other than drawing the plane? So when you want to associate a direction with a plane, we have been doing this already so far. If we did it with the Gauss's law. If you have a plane and you want to describe the direction of a plane with a single vector, you do that by defining, well, vector that's coming perpendicular to the plane. Now here's the difficulty. You have two vectors that can be perpendicular to this. It can be coming out of the plane or it can be going into the plane. They are both perpendicular to the plane. They are both valid normal vectors to the plane. So, so how do you pick, so you know, this is already an improvement. Before that you had on, like if you're looking for a vector within the plane, there's an infinite number of them. But by focusing on the vectors that are perpendicular to the plane, I've narrowed my choice down to two. But I still need to pick one unique direction. So if, for those of you who remember physics 4A, uh, how do we pick that unique direction? Right hand rule. Is there anything special about right hand? That it's the correct one? <laughs> Why is that the correct one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. In other words, um, 
Why, so, you know, why is it right hand rule and not left hand rule? Mm, okay, if, raise your dominant hand, please. Okay, I count about, no, you don't have to be embarrassed. Yeah, Richard. So when you look at the dominant hands raised, about you know 90% of you are right-handed. That's the statistic. So um, that's really the only reason we have a right-hand rule. It could have easily been a left-hand rule, but you know because we are the 90%, we decide to oppress the remaining 10%. No, just <laughs> kidding. But it, I'm trying to tell you it's an arbitrary rule. So we had to pick right hand or left hand to make a unique choice and we make an arbitrary choice that it's going to be the right hand. And the only reason it's right hand, sort of an accident of history. Who knows why 90% you know, of people are right-handed. If you read anthropology or something, some people suspect it, it started with the invention of tools, that but whatever. <laughs> so it, it, the fact is that there are more right-handed people than left-handed people. So it's easier for us right-handed people to use our dominant hand to apply this rule. That's why it's a right-hand rule. So people who are left-handed, all you have to do is you know, learn to use your non-dominant hand to apply this rule. So it does come down to, so we, using what we know about mathematics, using what we know about geometry, we were able to narrow the choice of vectors down to two. And what I'm trying to tell you is that there's no law of nature that will narrow it any further from there. We simply had to make a choice so that we have a common convention to use among all humans. Maybe Martians use left-hand rule, who knows? Um, so this is how you use right-hand rule. This is the basic right-hand rule. In this class, you're going to actually see two or three more shortcuts of right-hand rule in particular context. But this basic right-hand rule is what I stick with. And in your textbook, you might see the versions that use multiple, like three fingers. I never use that one. If you use, want to use that, great, do it. I never use the three finger version. I always use the one with my whole hand because this one will also morph naturally into the short, shortcut later when we introduce them. So this is the right hand rule. I orient my hand so that it goes in the direction of the first vector, or I you know, put the hand in the direction of the first vector, and I orient my hand so that I can bend my fingers in the direction of the second vector. So that means I have to turn it um, this way. Then, it, so once I have my hand oriented correctly, my right hand oriented correctly, so that it's pointing in the direction of first vector, and when I curl my fingers, it bend my fingers, my fingers bend in the direction of the second vector, then uh, the direction of the thumb tells me the direction of the A cross B. So, um, so the thumb is either coming out of the board or into the board. Those are my two choices. And here, what my direction of thumb tells me is that C must be coming out of the board. So C is coming out of the board. Right? So that's the right-hand rule. That's the basic right-hand rule. And as we get into magnetism more, you will see a couple shortcuts that, you know, that's useful, but you, I want you to be solid in the basic right-hand rule first. So let me actually draw a few combination of vectors on the board and have you do this exercise you know, in the next five minutes or so, check with your neighbors and um, I want everyone to get a chance to practice this because you can you know, hear and see me do this all day long, but if you didn't try it yourself, you'll kind of forget it or there'll be some source of confusion that you don't address now. So uh, let me just draw, um, Let's see, let's do two, uh, four examples. So one, four is a bad number. Let me do five. Two, one, four is a numerologically unfortunate number. I would do eight, but I don't think I can come up with the eight examples. Never mind. No, no one here pays attention to any kind of numerology? All right, so let me do um, A. B, and just for fun, let's say these two are perpendicular, and A, B, um, A, B, and I'm going to try to draw, um, um, draw it the three-dimensional uh, vector. Everyone here remembers the notation that this means out of, and this means into, yes, everyone remembers that? 
Let me write two vectors here each using that notation. So my, uh, let's say A is going into the board and my B points this way. And let's say my uh, A comes out of the board and my B points downward. All right, so five examples. Hopefully, it'll take you five minutes or so or less to figure out direction for all five of them. Um, when you get an answer, compare it with your neighbors, and we'll come back to go over answer for all of them as a class. Everyone done one through three, right? Yeah, let's just talk through one through three first. So the challenge with the four and five, for those of you who are still thinking through, is that you have to think three-dimensionally. So. Um, one through three are easier because you are dealing with essentially only two dimension. All these vectors are in this one single plane. So um, let's get through this first and then I'll give you a couple more minutes to wrap up discussion on this and come back to this. So one, uh, what is the direction of A cross B? Out of the plane. So this is the plane you are dealing with. So your choice is always going to be, is it coming out or is it going in? So here, A, so this way, so A cross B, it's coming out of the board. All right, what about two? Out of, did anything change from one to two in terms of direction? So what changed in terms of, because A cross B here probably isn't the same as A cross B here. What changed? So the angle here changes, what does that affect? Magnitude, because if you remember, A cross B, the magnitude of it was the magnitude of A times magnitude of B times sine theta. So if this angle theta decreases from 90 degrees, that will make the cross product smaller in magnitude. But in terms of direction, it's still the same direction. It's still out of the board. Yeah. What about A cross B here? Into, yeah, you sort of find your way, A cross B, so it goes into the board. So you know, if you got one through three correctly, then you're on a good step. Four and five are going to be challenging um, because you have to think three-dimensionally. Uh, before I give you a couple more minutes, let me just give you a hint. Um, one of one main property of the cross product that A cross B is this is its key key property that in fact it's a defining property is that this it's perpendicular with the vector A and it's also perpendicular with the vector B. Whatever the cross product is, it has to be perpendicular with the, both of these vectors. You see that it's true here. Whatever vector is coming out of the board or into the board, it has to be perpendicular with any vector that's within this plane. The thing that makes it difficult here is it makes it difficult for you to see the plane here because the plane of A and B is not the board plane. But when you get the direction of the vector, that should still have this property. It's perpendicular to B and perpendicular to A. So a couple minutes to wrap up. I, some of you are still talking about it when I interrupted you. So, and then uh, we'll come back and wrap this up. Uh, are you guys done? Yes, okay. So let me draw the answer on the board. So A cross B, this, uh, wrong color. Let me, I meant to grab green. A cross B, this should be the direction for A cross B. Note that it's perpendicular to both the vector A, which is coming out of the board, so it's perpendicular to this vector, and it's perpendicular to B. Hey, did I? It's into, yeah, yeah, so, so I, or, yeah, let me go through this. I take my right hand, orient it so that it's going into the board. I can turn this any way around, but I turn it just enough so that when I bend my fingers, it'll go in the direction of B. So the direction of the thumb is roughly the direction where A cross B is going, but really what I'm going to do as I draw this, I'm going to make sure that this is perpendicular to B. Because as long as I draw this on this plane, it's automatically perpendicular to A. So what I care about is, is it perpendicular to B? The other thing that may help you visualize it is, it helps you visualize it if you visualize the plane of those two vectors first. So this is A, this is B. So, you know, so imagine the plane that's defined by these two. Then A cross B has to go perpendicular to this. It's either going this way or coming out this way. And really, the, 
so you cannot put more burden on right hand rule than this. The only thing right hand rule is designed to tell you is all of those two perpendicular directions, which one? That's really the only thing it's designed to tell you. So when I do A uh, cross B, then it's a one on this side, not one on the other side. Yep. So that's four, uh, five, uh, a little more. Okay, so this should be the direction of A cross B. Coming out of the board, sort of pointing this way. And I orient my hand so that I can bend downward. Thumb points to the right. So, yeah. so that's it. Um, once again, the examples one through three are reasonably simple. Hopefully, everyone got that. Four and five is where it gets tricky. Text practice. Um, so one of the things that all of this tells you is that to describe magnetism, magnetic force, you need the full three dimensions. So everything we have done up to now could have been done in two dimensions. We draw electric fields in two dimensions, we draw equipotentials in two dimensions. But once you get to magnetism, you have to come face with the fact that we live in three-dimensional world, and there's no way to describe this phenomenon without using all three dimensions. 